morning, everyone. Welcome to Kathy's Valley Baptist Church. You guys want to stand up or find your seats, stand up and uh, do some worship here? His faithful followers I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. Come on up, Wes. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to Kathy's Valley Baptist Church. Our pastor sends his love, his prayers, and he misses you guys, and he's excited to come back. He should be here Wednesday preaching. So a couple of announcements we have before we pray. We do have a teen activity this coming Saturday. Um, we're going ice skating, so if your teens want to come, please let us know by this afternoon, we have to buy tickets because we need to know how many people are coming. Um, we had scheduled a teen parent meeting, but I only see like two teen parent meetings, so I think I'm going to move that till next Sunday. Hopefully, we can get all the teens and their parents here so we don't have to announce it like four or five times. So the teen parent meeting is moved till next Sunday after the morning service. Next Sunday night, which is January the 17th, we have a missionary coming in from Laos, and then we have the first and third uh, Wednesdays of the month. We have the ladies' prayer walk. We can see Anna about there. Anna about that. We also have the men's prayer breakfast every Wednesday morning at eight or at eight a.m. We're meeting right now at Happy Burger because well they're the only restaurant open and we're happy to support them. Let's just pray and then um, we'll finish the song service. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this 
opportunity to gather here today with these fellow believers. I pray that you would help Ken as he comes and brings his word. Lord, I pray for those who are not able to make it, who are hurting, and I pray that the word and this message would just be an encouragement to them. In your name, amen. Death could not hold you, the veil told before you, the silence of ghosts of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against, what a powerful name it is, the name. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. You guys want to stand up for the last song? And the whole room just feels a little strange, a little different. Uh, so that's right, turn the mic. Forget that mic every time. All right. Well, I'm thankful that my son gave me the opportunity to check out this new building, build a preaching pulpit, all the work, and didn't get a chance to preach in it. It's nice to be back, nice to be in the word with you um, seems like forever for me, and uh, we'll give it a shot. Got to brush off the old cobwebs and get with the word of God. It's so uh, just an honor to be in the word of God. There's so many, um, I think of any time right now is the time that we need to be in God's word. Um, my message is not just the process of holy humbling, but when things don't make sense, God does. When things don't make, make sense, God does. And I think in such a time as this, we would turn to the Old Testament, to Judges chapter 20. Sometimes God's people just need, oh, we're going to dismiss the children, children's church, we'll let you go on that way. 
to the back. I've got to say, this last year has been just a wonderful time listening to my son preach. And uh, it's been a great honor just to sit under him and to watch him grow in his ministry and watch you all grow. Um, <clears throat> to know God's work is never done in vain, that his work isn't built on a person, but on his word. And uh, hopefully it will never change. Humbling is a really difficult thing. I think for Americans, because we're so prideful. I mean, we're self-sufficient. We have everything we could ever ask for. And uh, sometimes we just think we uh, have it together. We have everything we really need to be successful, if you think about it. Even the poorest of poor have everything in America what they need to really feel successful. But God measures success in a different light. And I will say this, that when things don't make sense, when things don't seem that God is in them, he is. And God does have a plan, and even when things go bad. We have the, one of the great intentions, one of the greatest hearts to do great things. I remember standing to say, no good deed goes unpunished. I always remember that because so many times you try to do something good. You ever try to do something good for somebody? I mean, you try to really do something nice for them, and then it turns on you, right? It, somehow you're the bad guy or something goes wrong, and, and, and you just feel like, man, I just, you know, I had great intentions, and it just went south. Um, sometimes we think we have arrived. Sometimes the church believes that we're okay, that everything we're doing is fine, and I'm in the Word once a month, and I go to church every week, and everything's going to be good. But in reality, things aren't really good. I mean, according to our standards, we're better than the guy next to us. <laughs> better than the people out there. So I must be okay. In Judges, there's a story of Israel. And I'm not going to get into it because, and I'm thankful I don't have it, I'm not going to go back and talk about Israel's sin because it was pretty hideous. Gideon, the, they, the, the Benjamites, they did some hideous things that was unconceivable or inconceivable. And God wasn't happy. And it came to the attention of all Israel. Israel had several tribes. The rest of the tribes heard this. Now, I, I want you to remember as we walk through this, that they weren't all so innocent themselves. It's just that they didn't do a hideous sin as their brothers did. But they still were sinning. They were in idolatry. They were self-willed. They were doing their own thing. So we get in this story and we think, well, man, these four guys are trying to do a good deed and do justice and bring justice, and they got slapped down. But the truth was they weren't so innocent themselves. They had let things get out of control. They weren't confronting sin. They weren't confronting their nation, and their nation got worse and worse, and one day they woke up, and they had gotten so bad, they didn't realize how bad they really got till they were confronted with a hideous sin. You can read it for yourself. And now, they want to do something about it. And in doing something about it, they're going to pay a penalty, right? Because God has to work with their hearts first, so they don't continue to get more conceited than what they already are. It reminds me of a pastor. I tell my grandkids they love this story. A man was preaching, and he was uh, all excited. He was uh, an evangelist. And he was in the pulpit, and he was preaching. He was all preaching his heart out. And the doors of the church kept swinging open. And on the other side of the door was, uh, was a bricklayer. And the bricklayer was laying bricks, and, and he was doing his own business, and the doors kept swinging open, and, and he made eye contact with this bricklayer who was right in front of him in the doors, and, and he got excited, and he said, you know, open those doors, open wide, let that sinner come inside, and he was all excited about it, and, and uh, that old bricklayer just kept laying bricks, and he just preached a little harder, and that doors would flap open, and he saw him, and he goes, you know, open those doors, open them wide, let that sinner come inside. And that guy just kept laying, but he kind of looked at the guy and gave him like a mean look. And I think, oh, I think I'm, you know, he's feeling convicted now. I think I got this guy. 
And he starts preaching hard and hard. He said, you know, open those doors. Open them wide. Let that sinner come inside. And that guy just kind of gives me this really rough look. He goes, oh, I got this guy, man. He's ready, man. This, oh, this guy was so excited. And the last time, he, them doors flapped open. He says, open them doors. Open them wide. Let that sinner come inside. And that bricklayer looked at him and took a brick and raised it and chucked it. <coughs> and the old preacher said, shut them doors. Shut them quick. Some sinner done thrown a brick. You realize sometimes good deeds don't go unpunished. Sometimes you think you got someone where you want them, but it doesn't turn out the way you think it ought to turn out. In Judges chapter 20, verse 18, And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God. Now, when you read this, think about the words that are being said here, because it's real critical how they say what they say and what they do. Which was used uh, shall go up first. Okay, they, they go they go before God and they ask counsel of God and they said, "Which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin?" Benjamin was the one who created the sin, who did a hideous sin that woke up Israel to say, "We have gone way too far. We've crossed the line." Does it sound a little familiar to you today? <laughs> sound like America to me. <laughs> And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. He took the biggest and baddest, so let them go. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and camped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. The men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them in Gibeah. I will tell you this little history. 400 men they had, one of the strongest armies there are. That's why they weren't worried about going up. They didn't go to God and say, uh, which one of us should go up? I mean, they did say that. What they didn't say is, should we go up? <laughs> See, if you ask the wrong question, you always get the wrong answer. Right? They asked the wrong question, they got the wrong answer. They said, who goes first? They had 400 men. It was a hand... Benjamin had 25, 26,000 at the most. 400 to 26,000. Who do you think is going to win? Man, on a bad day, you know the 400 is going to win. They don't send all 400 because they are so bad, they don't send a few. <laughs> they are so confident, they don't even need God. They just were asking God, who's going to go first? So God said, let Benjamin go. The children of Benjamin came before out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground the Israelites that day, 22,000 men. One battle. Send Judah against Benjamin. We got this. They send their guys down. They get whooped. They lost 22,000. And for all, according to our knowledge, it doesn't say how many ben the Benjamites lost. I don't think they lost any. They may have lost a couple. But 22,000, they were beat down. We're going to talk more about this as we go on. But let's just, talk, let's just read the story and find out what happens all the way through. And the people, and the, people the men of Israel, encouraged themselves. Come on, we got this. We just didn't send enough guys out. <laughs> they sat in a battle against them in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and asked. The men went up. I'll tell you that right now. Not everybody, just the men. The counsel of the Lord saying, Shall I go up against the battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? You notice a little change here? We're going to go after those Benjamites now. They're a little humbled, and they say, well, our brothers who are Benjamites, now they're at least acknowledging them that they're family. <laughs> and the Lord said, go up against him. And the children of Israel, nope, they came near the children of Benjamin the second day. Benjamin went forth against them out of the Gibeah the second day. And destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel again 
18,000 men, all that do the sword. They go to battle again, now they lose 18,000. Now the numbers are adding up. Listen, they have this hands down. How are they losing? They're do- I mean, really think about it. Aren't they doing a good deed? Aren't they doing something good? They're getting rid of these sinful people, but their hearts aren't any different than the sinful people because their hearts still are trusting in their what? Flesh. We got this. I can do it. I'm self-made. I don't need God. <coughs> God was just an icon. God was just like a lucky charm. Remember they had idols? Yeah, many idols. He was just one more idol. In fact, the word they used there was deity when they first approached God. In the Hebrew, it meant deity. The second time they go to God, you know what they say? Or the third time? They call him Yahweh, the Jehovah God, the God Moses used, his name that he used. All of a sudden, they're a little more humble. Now they're really talking about who God really is, right? First it was, and we say it all the time, I'm trusting God. But it's just a flippant thing that we say, right? Oh, I trust God in this, or I believe in God in this. We just kind of like flippantly use God as a lucky charm. I'm going to do this, God, you come with me, and we're going to go do this, and you follow me. He's a lucky charm. There comes a place in your life when you are so far down, you're so beaten down, you've lost so much, now he's no longer just a lucky charm. He is to you the God of the universe. Where you have to go humbly before God and say, God, I need your help. Pastor John talked about that at Sunday school. I need your help. These guys approach God a little differently, as we see, as we go farther down. And the Benjamites went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground the children of Israel. Again, 18,000 men, all that drew the sword. (laughs) Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up. And came into the house of God and wept. You notice now what's happening? Yeah, a little humbled, aren't they? You realize not just the men went up now, the women, the children, everybody realized we're in trouble. We need help. We need our hearts changed. And now they become humble. And everybody, all of them came together and they wept before God, and they sat there before the Lord and fasted. Now they're thinking serious. Now they've taken something away from themselves. Their self-pleasures, they fast until the evening, and then they offer burnt offerings, peace offerings before God. Now they're getting serious. Now they realize they need to make a sacrifice to get God's attention. I find oftentimes in the many years of ministry and even some time off thinking about this, sometimes we don't really want to sacrifice. I mean, we say we want to sacrifice and we talk about sacrifice, but we really don't sacrifice much, do we? We pretend to sacrifice. Somehow we think it's like a club or a game, but listen, as times get tougher, people get more humbled. I think America is in for a a rude awakening. And I think it's about time. I preached it 10 years ago. It's coming, it's coming. I don't like it. I don't want it. I don't know what the future even holds. I know some of us are disappointed in what's going on. I think we're going to be more disappointed as we see other things coming in. But I think sometimes we need to stop and look at our, and focus on what's important. You see, this isn't about the world. Listen, it wasn't about... The other nations doing sin, they were doing those same sins. God wasn't surprised at sin, that man is depraved and man's doing sin. He's not shocked at it. And God literally wants to bring them to himself, but the truth is, who is he really worried about? You and me, the believers. God's concerned about how we act. God's concerned about how the church is acting. God's concerned about how the church is responding. And I tell you right now, the things I see in churches today... It's not really, I, I'm not impressed. Listen, come on. Really, we're self-willed. We're arrogant. 
It's called the new cool Christianity. I come to church, I look cool. We have our coffee shops. We have our cool way we dress. We have the cool this, the cool that. We have the, I mean, it's that new generation, I guess. I don't know. It's the cool Christianity. I say cool things. I get the little digs, the little, we, have, we don't, just, it's changed. You, you have, I mean, am I the only one saying it makes? I'm old now. <laughs> the church has changed. <laughs> and I don't think it's for the good. <laughs> I think the church is doing some great things. I think the church is doing some awesome things all across America. We're doing some awesome things, but there are things that we're doing, it's not what we are. It's not that we're seeking God in humility and saying, God, man, you find any wicked way in me, change me. Please change me. I've seen Christians lately, not lately, but in the last year, I've seen some Christians, and I, because now I'm a pastor now, that people are more let down. They let their guard down a little more now, so I see a little more true colors. I can think of a few Christians I saw, and, and, they, and they were so cruel, I thought to myself, and I confronted them, I said, you're not a Christian. You can't be a Christian and do that. You can't think that way. Well, who are you to judge me? I'm not judging you. The Bible's already judged you. Christians just don't do that. Christians just, they're not mean. They're not spiteful. (laughs) They're not hateful. And sometimes I find myself getting drug into it too as well. It's easy because we're humans, right? We're humans. It hurts. And we get hurt. What do we want to do? We want to hurt back. And yet I've seen other Christians who've been so hurt, I thought, you need to go after them. You need to go beat them down. You need to do something. And uh, they say, no, I forgive them. It's like, whoa, okay, lesson number one, Ken. Pretty awesome. Now, I'm going to forgive. And the truth is, I might not even be able to forgive because God doesn't give me the grace and the mercy to do that because that's not my problem. But God will send other problems my way. He'll give me that mercy at the time to, to do the right thing. They come to God in total humility and they cry out to God and say, God, man, we are messed up. We can't, listen, you know what God did? He took a tenth of their army. You realize he took the tithe out of their army? They never tithed anyway after that. They quit their tithing. They quit everything. They quit giving things to God. They just played church. And they mixed God with the idolatry. And that's what they did. And now they're asking God for help. And God's saying, hey, you know what? First, I'm going to give you help. Yeah, but first got to help you a little better. Right? we got to do a little more work on you. We need to help your heart. Because that's what I'm more worried about than the stuff they're doing. Because if he can get to your heart, all the other stuff will go away. <laughs> See what I'm saying? If God could change the hearts of people, all this other stuff, nonsense going on in the world, is going to go away. But if we're just trying to get to superficial, we want people to dress like a Christian, want them to act like a Christian, say things as a Christian, but their heart isn't Christian, their heart isn't godly, then really we've done a disservice to the people around us. There's a story of a man who once had a dream God placed a huge boulder before him, and God said, I want you to push this boulder. And the man said, okay, God. And in this dream, this guy pushed, pushed, and he pushed, and he pushed, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked. The the boulder did not budge. And so he goes back, and in the next dream, he says, I want you to go back to the boulder. Next morning, I want you to push on that boulder. And he says, okay, God. And he gets to the boulder, and he pushes, and he pushes, and he gets it, and he pushes. Oh! day long he labors pushing this boulder because he believes God told him and he's pushing this boulder and he's pushing and the boulder doesn't even budge and the next night he goes and he has a dream and God said I want you to go back I want you to push that boulder again he said okay God and, and he pushes and he pushes and he pushes all day he labors pushing this boulder and the boulder doesn't even budge and he goes back to God and God says you're finished you fulfilled your mission What do you mean, God, I feel my mission? I feel defeated. I feel like, I feel useless. I feel like I didn't accomplish one thing. What a waste of time. He says, was it? You're a lot stronger than you were before. Sometimes the task that God puts before us isn't about the task. It's about us. See, the task wasn't about Israel winning a battle against their brother. 
It was about their heart getting right before they went to battle. God wasn't concerned about, God knew that they were sinning, and this sin was hideous, and he knew they still were sinning, maybe not as hideous, they still were doing the same old kind of stuff. (coughs) And God was more concerned about their hearts than he was about the mission. (coughs) And when they came, they prayed to God, and they got on their knees before God, and they prayed and fasted, and they gave burnt offering, Offerings, they went to Phineas, the son of Eleazar, in verse 28, of the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? Now he's using my brother, right? Focused. Or shall I cease? Man, don't pass. I tell you, I read through that, pass it right up. Okay, so I go or not. Listen to me. What is different from the first two times he asked God? Who do we send first? We got this. We have 400 men, skilled warriors. We got this. They only have 26,000. Hands down, we're the, we're the bomb. We just want to know who we send first, God. God send, send Judah. 22,000 men. Boom, gone just like that. Almost three to one. How do you lose? It goes out again. Hey, God. Okay, uh. We're going to go out the second day. Okay, go ahead. Boom, 18,000 men, boom, gone. Tenth of their army, gone. They paid their tithe. <laughs> Made up for all the time they didn't give it God diddly. Now all of a sudden they want something from God. God said, okay. Now they're a little humbler and they go before God. They fast, they pray. Everyone together, not just the men, they are, they're humbled, they're cut to the quick, their hearts are changing. They realize we are just as bad as they are. We need help. We cannot, now we're at the, now listen, they're at the place they can't do it now. And they tell God, God, we're going to get our lives right. And then they go to God and they say, God, should we go tomorrow? And they never said this before, or should we not go tomorrow? You see the difference now? Now they're asking God the right question. Do I do it or not? It's not, I'm going to do it. Who does it first? How many times you go to God and say, God, should I do this? God said, go ahead, and you fail. So God told me, I don't know how I failed. Because maybe you ask God, God, do you want me to do that? Maybe he don't want you to do that. But they went to God and said, God, I want to do this. Do you think we shouldn't? And God says, you know what? You go ahead. I'm going to take care of it. You're going to win. Twenty-nine. And Israel set liars and wait round about Gibeah. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and put themselves in array against Gibeah as at other times. And the children of Benjamin went up against the people and were drawn away from the city. They began to smite of the people and kill as at other times in the highways of which one goeth up to the house of God. And to the order of Gibeah in the field, about 30 men of Israel. And the children of Benjamin said, They are smitten down before us as the first. But the children of Israel said, Let us flee and draw them from the city into the highways. And all the men of Israel rose up out of the, this, their place and put themselves in array at Bel Tamar, well, Tamar. And the liars of weight of Israel came from out of their places, even unto the meadows of, of Gibeah. And there came against Gibeah 10,000 chosen men out of all Israel. And the battle was sore that they knew not that evil was near them. And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel, and the children of Israel destroyed of the Benjamites that day 20 and 5,000 and 100 men all that drew the sword. So the children of Benjamin were, saw that they were smitten, for the men of Israel gave place to the Benjamites because they trusted into the liars in wait which they had set before Gibeah. <laughs> you know, Israel gave them a chance the first time. In fact, they sent messengers told 
the Benjamites, they said, listen, this is a very sinful thing you did. And you need to take those people and do justice. Take them out and smite them, kill them. They're hideous. They did hideous things, things that are unspeakable. He said, you need to take these guys out. And they said, we are not. We're going to protect. We're going to protect the sinner. All I'm saying is they never executed justice. And because of that, they suffered greatly. When you don't do things right, when you don't execute justice in a timely manner, it will get worse. But y'all will tell you this, Christian, God is in control. God knows what's going on. You can trust God. And I will tell you this, it's easy to say, trust God. A little more harder to trust God, isn't it? I mean, you could say it. We all say it, right? I trust God. Let's pray. And we really don't need to throw a prayer prayer out there. It's just so superficial, Christianity. It's just like, when we see things in sin, we just want to make excuses. Well, it's a new error. God understands. No, he doesn't. God hasn't changed. The sin in the Bible is still the sin today. It's still sin. It's just a matter, where's your heart? It's like the guy who says, I know it's sin, I'm going to do it anyway. What's that? Is that humility? To me, that's arrogant, and I'm telling you, it's sad. But we see it all around. The new generation coming up, I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. It's just the way it's going to be, and you just got to get over it. No, you don't have to get over it. Right. And it's amazing when you tell someone something in love, why are you judging me all the time? Why are you judging me? You know, I'm not judging you. I'm just trying to help you. We're trying to make sure you're safe, Right? Say the right thing to help you out. But yet, don't they just slam you down? A young minister was asked to, to speak with three, as a, uh, three of, uh, uh, the one of three speakers. The two speakers were around and were one of the greatest orators around. One middle-aged, one older. He felt honored to be on the stage with these men. They were seated on the stage, each of them waiting their turn to speak. The senior of all the pastors was the first on deck. The young preacher was so nervous that he forgot his Bible. First speaker got up and started speaking, and the old young man just leaned over to the older, older seasoned preacher. He says, I forgot my Bible. He goes, what? He goes, I forgot my Bible. He said, oh, man, don't worry. God will supply. God will give you the words. Okay. So he's sweating BBs, right? And so this preacher gets up and he starts preaching. Man, he's just eloquent and, and his, his orator and he, he's sharing this great message. And the guy realizes the first point was his first point on his message. He goes, oh, dude, we're in trouble. He starts sweat, breaking in a sweat. He leans over to the old, pa- the old preacher. He goes, oh, man, he just, he just used my first point. What do I do? He says, don't worry, brother. God will give you the words. All right, so now he's sweating BBs, right? And this guy just goes in this message, and it's just eloquent. He's thinking, he just took my next point. He preached his whole message. And he leans over to the the old man. He says, the old priest says, man, I'm in trouble. He said, what's wrong? He said, he just preached my whole message, and he's so eloquent. I, I can't even add anything to it. He said, don't worry, my son. God will give you the words. He just shook his head and that senior pastor got off the pulpit and went to sit down, and the guy nudged, you're next. You're on deck. And he goes, dude, he's like, what am I going to do? And he said, can I borrow your Bible to the, the, the preacher he kept talking with? And the old preacher gave him his Bible, and he went up to the pulpit, and he set it down. And he's thinking, what do I say? I'm like, he's blanking. How do I even, like, out preach this? These guys are awesome. And, and he opens the Bible, and lo and behold, there's that preacher's message in the middle of the book. And he says, God gave me a message. So he preaches the old guy's message. And the old guy's like, what is he doing? He's preaching my message. And he's getting on it, and, he's, and it says cry here, and he cries there. And he just, he does a, just an eloquent job in this message. And, and, and uh, he's all excited, and, and the people are just coming up forward and all excited. And the, the old preacher's going, he just preached my message. And the, and the young man comes down as he gets done, and he says, you're on deck, sir. And he gives him his Bible. He says, what am I going to do? You just preached my message. He says, don't worry, my brother. God will give you the words. <laughs> it's easy to tell someone that until it's your turn. 
I remember one time, I, I was probably the second week I was preaching, and uh, we were in that schoolhouse. And, well, it was not my second, second one in the schoolhouse. But anyway, I was preaching. And my first, like, real sermon, uh, my second real sermon, I was all excited. But anyway, I got there, and, and I got so excited that, uh, and, and there was so much to do, because we had to tear all the stuff out of the schoolroom at the Catholic Valley School. We had to take, we had, a, like, a trailer that had a nursery in it. And so we had a lot of work to do, right? So I got just so much on my mind. And I got to the church, and we emptied the church out, and we got everyone settled in, got all the, what we had to get in, get ready for church. And then it comes time for a message, and I go up to my message, and I can't find my Bible. And I say, okay, now, I had a bunch of jokesters back then. It's like, kind of like Josh. Don't, I tell my son, don't trust Josh. Something might happen. You know, your, your notes might be gone someday. And no offense, Josh. But I had a couple guys here, rascals, and I thought they took my Bible. Then they're messing with me. And I said, hey, you know, where's my Bible? I need my Bible. Come on, don't joke around like that. I got to preach in like two seconds. Like, we don't even know. No one knows your Bible's at. Well, I had left it at home with my message. And I was so nervous. I had practiced that message. I practiced and practiced and practiced. So I knew it by heart. And so I said, well, and I got at the pulpit. And I said, I'm sorry. I forgot my Bible. I'm just sorry. And I forgot my message. But I know it kind of in my mind. And I just, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what to do. And the little girl was sitting in the front row, and she goes, Pastor Ken. I go, yes. And she goes, use my Bible. Now, all I got to say is, my Bible's my Bible. I know where everything's at. But you get me your Bible, and I'm lost, right? I mean, it's like an old book, right? You're so used to being there. And you have all your, I had everything all marked. And she hands me this little ch- children's Bible. What are you going to say? No, I don't want that thing. Give me a real, uh, you, know, you know, your pastor's, oh, thank you. Now you're really humbled. Now you open this little children's Bible and thinking, oh, man, I am so in trouble, you know. And I'll tell you, at the end of the story, really, God blessed it. It was good. We had some good, um, it, I mean, it worked, it worked out. We got through it, and uh, God just gave, it's funny how God just gives you the words, just things. And I would look down and think, you know, the pages look like blank. They just look like all scribbly scrub, and I'm thinking, Oh, man, I came in focus, man. I didn't even see that. And all of a sudden, God just started popping these scriptures out because I had chosen this message where I was flipping from d- different verses in this Old Testament. So I had them all marked where I was going to go. And when you have nothing marked, it's like now you've got to find them, right? And it's just like God popped these. Like, it just came out. Like, they were darker than all the other. And I was just, it was just, God just was there that night. I, I look back, and I told God, okay, if I can do this, God, I can do, you can get me through anything. If you can get me through this. And it was just a blessing to show that God was able to take care of things. God is able to supply. See, Israel had to learn that God was able to supply all their needs according to riches and glory. That Israel had to realize their heart had to be changed before God could use them. I'm going to tell you something, Christian. You may be going through a hard time, but I'm going to tell you something. It's not fun. I'm not going to say you may not even deserve it, but I'll tell you this. God is going to use that to do great and mighty things through you. Because right now, you're at a place where you're so humbled. You're so devastated. You're at your wit's end. You don't know which way to go. You don't know what you're supposed to do next. And God, you know what? All you need to do is go before God and say, God, I'm yours. Do with me as you wish. What do you want me to do, God? I'm open. My heart right now, do you want me to do it or not do it? Do you want me to go here or not go here? What do you want me to do, God? I'm willing to follow you. And in the midst of a trial, God is working on your heart so that he can do mighty and great things through you. But until your heart is right, he can't do anything with you. You're a useless tool for God until your heart is right with God, until you seek total humility. I believe God cannot use the church in America today till he humbles the church. I really believe. Judgment starts in the house of God. That's what he says in the Bible, right? He starts with his church to humble his church people to get their hearts right so they'll become a one unit, of one mind, so that we know where we're going, what we're doing, that we're not going to bring the world into the church, but we're going to go out to the world and give them the church. Amen. We've let the, the world come into the church way too long, and it's almost hard to distinguish between the world and the church. It's all, it's all the same. It's anonymous. But there's got to come a time in our lives where we are separate from the world. Now, the world does see us. Man, maybe they think you are a little weird. <laughs> but right now, weird's probably pretty good. <laughs> maybe we need to be more thoughtful 
a little more gracious, patient, kind. People are going to come in the church who aren't where you are. They're like rough. I remember, I won't say who the name, a, a young couple we were ministering to. And I remember she walked in the church and she, uh, she sat down in the church and it was, I mean, pretty mini, mini skirt in the front of the church. I'm trying to preach. I'm thinking, oh, man. And, and it was really hard. And I was just like, I said, what were you doing? I said, let me tell you, I just was looking everywhere but there. I said, and she was right. You know, we could have went there and said, what's wrong with you? You sinful girl, what do you think you're doing? You know what? I told ladies, you need to go take care of her and minister to her. The ladies came, they gave her, they just ministered to her. That lady became a godly woman. Her life changed. And it wasn't because people were coming saying, look at you, nasty thing. Look at you, you're just so worldly. They came in love and said, let us help you. Let us minister to you. We love you. We care for you. And she became a godly woman. I can tell you story after story of people who come in the church, and I'm one of them, who wasn't pleasant to see. I mean, I was so rough around. I was cussing in church. I didn't know any better. They said, you can't say that in here. I said, oh, really? Oh, okay. I had no idea what I, listen, I look back, I think I'm one of those guys you would have said, hey, you know, man, you probably need not to come to church. Well, we got a special room for you in the back. You can listen to this. Message. You know, we got a special room for the special people, and you're special. We're going to stick you back there. I came pretty rough around the corners, and I wasn't afraid to say things I said. But I tell you what, when God got a hold of me, it changed all of me. Amen. And I tell you what, I look back on some of the people that changed my life. They were the guys who were patient who were kind, who were thoughtful, who, took, who knew where I was and knew where I could be, what I could become, who were willing to invest time in me to change me. It would have been easy for them to judge me. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Listen, I already knew what was wrong with me. I didn't need someone to tell me what was wrong with me. I just needed someone to love me and to care about me, to say, hey, we're with you in this. You can beat this. You can win. I didn't know there was victory at the end of this whole Christianity road. It changed my life. And I think a lot of us here, our lives have been changed because someone came alongside us and said, hey, man, I love you and I care about you. Amen. And we're going to make this journey. We're going to win. And there's hope. See, Israel came with pride. Israel thought they could win. <laughs> Israel knew they could win. And they lost. The second time they came back, they knew they could win. But this time, a little more humbler. Listen. They're free from self, not of self. You see, they were free, but they still had this, a little more tingling of self in the second battle. But I'm telling you, on that third battle, they were free of themselves. They are free from themselves. They were free. They realized, hey, I am nothing. I cannot win. I am doomed. And they came before God in humility, and they asked God for help. And I'm going to tell you something. God helped them. Amen. And they won. A man received in the mail a barometer, one of the best money he could buy. He took it out of the box, and he looked at it, and the barometer said, Okay, and he said, oh, man, something wrong with this. And he banged this thing around a little bit, and he looked at a hurricane, banged around. Oh, he was so mad. He went to his desk and wrote a scathing letter. You know, I bought this expensive barometer. It says it's a hurricane. The, sky, the sky's blue outside. You, bu you know, I want my money back. And he went to town to mail the letter miles away. He came back home after mailing the letter. The barometer was gone. Not only the barometer was gone, his house was gone hurricane had come. See, he thought it was a mistake, but it wasn't. See, Israel was warned of their sin over and over. The Brahmin said, you need to change, and they didn't believe it. And they went to war, and they lost. They went again, and they lost. They came the third time, and they said, okay, God, we give up. You know what? You say we're sinful. You say we're self-willed. We're, we're, okay, we're done. Tell us what to do. We're, on, we're yours. And God said, okay, now I got you where I want you. You understand? They called him the God of deity. They had a lot of deity gods. They had a lot of gods who were deity. But when they came to him the last time, they called him Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Moses, the great God who met most in the bush. They Listen, when they approached God this time, they gave him his rightful title. 
You think, oh, titles don't mean anything. I'm going to tell you some title shows a sense of respect. You go to your pastor, Anthony, you don't say, Anthony. You say, Pastor Anthony. He earned the right. He'd been ordained by God to give the message. I just think, you know, you, you say the right thing. You give the right title. They came to God with the wrong title. He's, like we tell God all the time, oh God, God, oh thank God, oh God's good. But really, who is God? Who is your God? Answer me that. Who is your God? He should be the God of the universe. The God is in control of everything. He's even in control of your government. I wonder about that, but you know he is. He raises them up and he takes them down. It just might be that God's trying to talk to the church. Because I got a feeling the church is going to be in some persecution time. The church is going to be hassled a little bit in the next four years. You can say, oh, your conspiracy, you, know, you can tell all that. I don't want to hear it. We know it's coming. In fact, 10 years ago, I said it was coming, and I never thought it, and when I said it was coming, I didn't think we'd be like it is now. But listen, they think nothing of persecution. China right now are killing Christians, using their body parts. Yet we just turn a blind eye thinking, oh, it's not, it's not happening. It's happening, folks. Amen. Middle East, people are dying for their faith and willing to die for their faith. But we're not. So there's going to come a time where you're going to have to make a decision. Who are you going to live for? Who is your God? Do you trust him in the midst of your trial? Because God never comes off the throne. He's always in control. I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be okay. You know what? It doesn't matter. It's going to be okay because even if they do take our life, we still win. Come on, Christian. You still win. I, I'm not looking forward to it. I'm saying we're going to win. You can't threaten me with eternal life. Right? You're going to kill me. Okay, I still get eternal life. What do you get? We could say it, but do you believe it? You won't know it until it comes to you. But I'll tell you what, God will give you the grace when you need it. He'll give you the strength. But I'm saying right now, you need to prepare yourself and seek your God and seek his face and be real. Because he can tell a fake Christian from a real one. Let's all stand this morning. I appreciate the privilege and the opportunity Pastor Anthony gave to me to preach this morning. It feels good, again, to share God's word with you. I am passionate about the word of God. I'm not perfect either. And I'm totally aware of the things I need to change. But there are some things that you need to change. Jim, why don't you come and play for us, if you would? There's some things that you need to change. You need to get right with God. I give an invitation. It's not necessary to even come forward, but maybe right where you're at. Maybe you need to do something. Maybe you get something right with God. Maybe you need to get serious with God. Maybe something needs to happen in you. Maybe you need to talk to God about what's going on around you in this world, and you just need the strength. I want to give you that opportunity to pray to him. If you want to come forward, you can. If you want to kneel where you're at, you can. If you want to bow your head, you can. But I'm telling you, you need to do business with God right now. It's time that the church gets serious about their faith. Let's pray to our God. Father, I come before you. I ask that you change my heart first. If there's any wicked way in me, Lord God, I know what it is. You change me. Make me the man of God I need to be. Help those right now who are suffering. Suffering for things they have not brought upon themselves. It's part of the circumstance, but yet you ask them to be strong. They need direction. They need encouragement. They need love. 
Help us to give love and not judgment. Help us to give sound counsel, not counsel that will make them feel good. Help us to reach out and bring hope to this world that now has lost all hope. So many people are so discouraged with the closed up and locked up and they just need to know that you're there and that you love them and that you're going to be there for them. We ask and pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Well, Godspeed. Hopefully you'll be encouraged. Encourage those around you in this time of being locked down that let them know that God still loves them. God's there for them. God bless you.